very first contact lens that was ever created was actually a square lens. It was made of glass and it was huge. It covered the entire eye and it corrected the vision, but it was not breathable, uncomfortable, and also um, was really difficult to reproduce. So they created a plastic version of the scleral lens, which solved two problems. It was easier to reproduce because it could be labelable, meaning you, could, you can mold it um, and, and recreate it. But we still had so many issues with oxygen permeability. So they made the lenses much smaller. And so that's how the corneal lens was born. So a corneal lens sits on the cornea and it doesn't cover the whole cornea, so you're getting oxygen from the exposed part of the cornea. So then our materials got better. Hard lenses, which were called PMMA, became breathable, gas permeable lenses. And then now we're going back into the scleral lens designs. So when I first started um, with contact lenses, I think I was probably fitting maybe like 5% of my practice with scleral lenses. But they do so well now that I, as of right now, I'm thinking maybe closer to 50 to 60%, well, maybe 50%, just because um, they, they work so well. And I'm actually even starting to fit patients that just have normal um, nearsightedness um, with scleral lenses just because the comfort and the optics are so good. So you're, you're asking yourself if these lenses are right for you. And I always tell patients to, like, if their lenses, their rigid lenses or soft lenses are the best they could be and they're still having issues with tolerance and comfort and their eyes are dry or if the fit isn't stable or the vision isn't stable, these might be a good option for you. So I gathered some situations of patients that did really well with scleral lenses in my practice these past um, few weeks and I just wanted to go through them with you and if any of these sound familiar, um, you might be a good candidate. So I have a 32 year old female, she wears rigid lenses, she's a writer, she needs her lenses to last a long time because she's on the computer for long hours and she's literally using lubricating drops every one or two hours. I have another 46 year old male who wears soft lenses and he tried rigid lenses when he was younger but he was never able to adapt to them. He had a really hard time. I have a very outdoorsy 35 year old who was an avid mountain biker and he would wear these sealed goggles whenever he would ride his bike because he was really anxious about his lens ejecting or dirt flying underneath his lens. And a fourth patient, um, which is a little bit unusual, is that he is a, a RGP wearer where his contact lenses didn't fully correct his astigmatism. So he had to wear glasses to correct the astigmatism over his contact lenses. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the scleral lens. Um, insertion and removal is different than what you might be used to. With scleral lenses, you have to fill the, the bowl of the lens with saline. So you have to hold it in two, there's two different ways to hold it. You can hold it, this is like a tripod of your fingers and you fill it up here. Or you hold it with, this is like a plunger to keep it steady. And then your face needs to be face down when you put the lens in to keep all the fluid inside the lens. Removal is also a little bit different. These are little suction cups. So you have to release the suction slightly with your finger. Just rest the finger edge right on the edge of the lens to release the suction. And you can either flip out the lens with two fingers or you plunge it out with a plunger here. <coughs> so square lenses, what else can they do? Um, since they're a lot more stable than a regular rigid lens, we can control the optics a little bit more. You've probably never been offered a multifocal option um, by your optometrist if you're a keratoconus patient. And why is that? Multifocal optics are really important. Um, if they, for them to work, they have to be centered. So if you're trying to center a corneal RDP on an irregular surface, it's really difficult to do. So every blink will give you a different, um, basically you're looking through a different part of the lens. But with a scleral lens, since we can center it better, we can um, add the multifocal to the front surface and we can control where that lens sits on the eye. So these are just two different designs of multifocals. This is a concentric ring. So basically we're going from distance near, distance near, and your pupil is looking through those rings at the same time, and your brain has to switch between distance and near. Um, this is the aspheric design, which just means that the center part of the lens is near and the outer part is distance. So going back to that fourth patient we were talking about, some people need glasses to correct their astigmatism even with contact lens wear. So with a scleral lens, we can actually grind that astigmatism to the front surface of the lens 
to get rid of glasses because people hate it when I ask them to do this. Like, you need to wear glasses over your contact lenses to see the best. And so we can grind it into the contact lens. They don't have to do that. And these little dots here are the way that I look at um, the orientation of the stigmatism to make sure it's in the right place. So higher order aberrations are something that is relatively new that we can add more. Well, the feature of correcting higher order aberrations are, is new. Um, we can add it to scleral lenses now. And um, higher order aberrations are the blur and the glare and the ghosting that you see, even when your optometrist tells you that you are fully correcting your rigid lenses. I'm sure most of you have experienced this before. You're 20 20 in the exam room, and then you drive, and then you see this like starbursting and all this glare um, from the oncoming traffic. <coughs> so, we measure higher order aberrations with a machine called an aberrometer. So they're actually able to, they do this for LASIK patients. So you go in for your LASIK consult, they do this, this um, map, and they, they see if you have higher order aberrations. So if you do, then they'll do something called wave front guided um, laser where they can actually etch the prescription and specify the prescription into the cornea to correct these higher order aberrations. So we can do this, use the same type of technology and put it into scleral lenses. The only downside is that it's only available through one company right now, so it's not available everywhere. So as we fit uh, sclera lenses more and more, um, we're understanding the shape of the sclera a little bit more. Because before we never really <coughs> cared too much about how the sclera's shape is because we're, we're fitting the cornea. Um, so now that we know a little bit more about the sclera, we know that it's not round and we know that it's not symmetrical. And we have technology that can actually map the sclera just like we map the cornea. So this is this is really great because we use this technology to find the the normal curvature for scleras, and a newer generation of scleral lenses have been created to better fit these, our, our natural scleral shape and make it more comfortable for patients. So we're taking scleral curvature to another level with eye print prosthetic. This is something that we do um, at UCLA. So what this is, oh, you can, <laughs> great. So we have a, oh, I actually want to pass it around. So this is something we do at UCLA. Um, it's just like if you were to mold your teeth and create a crown. It's the same similar type of material, but this one is um, approved for the eye. So the mold is applied to the eye uh, for about a minute. It hardens, it's painless. We, uh, we don't put any anesthetic in the eye. And um, this is one of my residents that I practiced on. <laughs> Pulled out a ton of lashes, but um, uh, yeah, it's education. But <laughs> so then we create this mold, I send it into the lab, and the engineer will send me back this image, a 3D rendering of the mold. And then we'll talk about all these lumps and bumps and, and say, you know, we want to vault this area, we want to add more width to this area, and then we'll create a lens together um, through the software and make a lens that fits the eye perfectly. And it's, it's a really beautiful thing to see. Um, not everybody needs this though. Most people, like 95% of patients out there can actually wear a lens that's not moldable, but there are just some patients that need it. So here are some examples. Um, this is a patient that had a firecracker blow in his eye. Um, he had a scleral patch graft here, which is, um, you can see, it's, it's, it's quite significant. So we did a mold here, and you can see where that, um, where the elevation is. And the lens that's made for him, you might not appreciate this as much as I do, um, but if you look at where the lens is sitting, no part of these vessels are impinged. It's sitting very nicely and perfectly over that eye. So that's what we're looking at. Um, some other situations that um, that work really well with eye print. This is a glaucoma tube. Um, this patient had surgery, and these are really delicate. You don't want to put any pressure on these um, because that's keeping the engine running. You don't want to mess with that. So the scleral lens can actually fault that area. However many microns I need, I just um, tell the lab and they'll make it for us. And this patient was actually supposed to come to my office on Friday to pick up her lens, and I wanted to show you a picture with her eye, but um, she didn't make it, so I wasn't able to include that photo. The patient on your right is a patient who fell and perforated her eye, and they had to sew her shut, and they were able to save the eye, but we couldn't get any type of lens into her eye, just even see if her vision was, was safe, like, was there any vision there? And we were able to eye print her, 
and um, the eye print lens fit beautifully over her eye. And I just wanted to show you her lens. So this is a standard squirrel, squirrel lens. So you see it's very circular and symmetrical. This is the eye print lens that fits that patient. It looks like a potato chip. <laughs> but um, it's just, I just love looking at this because it, it just shows you how, how customizable this, this technology is. If you have a squirrel lens, it's a perfectly comfortable and fine, but it's not correcting your vision to you know, 2020 or as close as you'd like. Would an eye print help your vision be improved? Maybe. Depends. Um, you would have to have your higher or order operations um, evaluated, and you have, if you have a lot, we might be able to make the vision a little bit better by going down to the surface. Okay. Yes. I'm curious about the cost of something like that. Uh, we charge $3,500 per eye, so it's not something that I jump to, right. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's a really great option to have if someone has not done the well on their lenses. Question? So do, do those um, movable square lenses last as long as the regular one? They do, um, yes. So I would say the average life is about a year. Most people keep their lenses for at least two years. Um, it's not $3,500 every single time you need a new lens. It's just the first time when you have the lens molded to your eye. Excuse me? Right here. What yes. is the name of the machine that uh, measures the high or the duration you mentioned? So there are several different types of um, machines. Um, an averometer is basically what you're looking for. Okay. Okay. okay so this is moving away from scleral, well, sort of. The biggest complaint that I get from patients that wear scleral lenses is that their lenses fog in the middle of the day. And there's something new that we can coat the lenses with that can actually help with that. Um, tangible tangible hydropeg is polyethylene glycol. It's a water-loving molecule that binds water to the surface of your lens. So if you're someone that has a lot of protein in your tears and you're, you're seeing this like, fogging throughout the day, this coating can really help um, keep the lens clear throughout the day. But there's only certain solutions that you can use with it, which is the next thing we're going to talk about, is solutions. Does anyone have any questions so far about the hydropeg? Okay. So with soft lenses, um, clear care is my favorite, and like I'm not paid by them at all, but I you know, recommend this to most everybody. And the reason is because most patients that have care to have allergies, and they have lenses that need to last them all day. And um, this is a really good protein remover, it cleans lenses really thoroughly, it's hydrogen peroxide. It, um, the downside is that it's not foolproof, so you need to make sure that you soak your lenses overnight with the little case that it comes in so it neutralizes. Once it's neutralized, it's just pure saline, so it's really gentle when you put it into your eyes. Um, so it's great for allergies. Um, so clear care is great, and BioTrue and OptiFree are just great like regular soft lens solutions. I would just stay away from the, the ones that are store brand, just because you don't really know what, what formulation they are. They're usually older versions of the brand names, and you don't know if they're compatible with the materials that you wear. <coughs> so with rigid lenses, again, clear care, it's the only solution that you can use with both soft and hard. So it's really good for patients that wear a soft in one eye and a rigid in the other eye. It just keeps everything simple. Uh, Unique pH is another solution that I really like. I like um, and as opposed to like Boston Sim Plus is also very similar to this, but I like the neat pH, I think it wets a little bit better. And um, these are the two solutions that you can use with Hydropeg. Yeah. Now, Progen is their version of, uh, unique pH is version of the deep cleaner. It's a protein remover. It's really good for patients that tend to build up on their lenses. Um, I have a polisher in my office and will polish lenses for patients. But after I started recommending Progen, we're polishing fewer and fewer. And that's great because my machine's gonna break one day. <laughs> and I don't think I can replace that. I don't think they make them anymore. Um, so Progen's really great. It's not good for hydropeg, so don't use that if your lenses are hydropeg. Yeah. 